with Edward A. Holyoke, Professor of Anatomy, University of Nebraska College of Medicine. The date is July 26, 1979. I am Bernice Hetzner, Emeritus Professor of Library Science. Dr. Holyoke, I know you're somewhat of a history buff yourself. Uh, would you like to just tell us what you know about the history of the medical center, or would you like to have me kind of prod you with questions? Or I think we go a little better. We start you probably with a few questions to begin with, <laughs> and we may get a line of thought started yeah. here. Well, you must have decided early on to be a physician, is that correct? Oh, somewhere about the uh, middle of my high school days. And, Which would be um, about 1922 or 1923, somewhere along in there. And you decided to go to Shadron then? Did they have well, a strong family? Well, uh, family lived in Shadron then. Oh. You Which happened to be the reason, uh, see, I went through high school in the prep school at the college. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the family, um, then I took one year of college there simply because there was the family. and. It seemed to be going to work out all right. Mm -hmm. Did they have a pretty good uh, pre-med program at that time? Not very. Mm -hmm. Worked out a good deal better to get down to uh, get a, uh, two years down in Lincoln. So we went two years to Chadron. So I went one year. I went one year of college at Chadron and two in Lincoln oh, yes. before I came to medical school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, there must have been about four or five who took uh, their pre-medic work at Chadron. Part of it at Chadron or all of it. Only one that didn't bust out was me. Oh, they they did those five go on to Lincoln then, or did they? Oh, uh, at least three of them there? came directly down came down directly from Shadron. I see. Of course, we had a couple of other Shadron boys that had gone to school in Lincoln and come into medical school, and they made uh -huh. it all right. Uh huh. Uh huh. And of course, Perry Tolman took part of his work at Shadron before he came down to the university and everybody knows the kind of a record he made all over the place. Yes, yes. So uh, mm -hmm. you can't blame Shadron for all woes of some of these people. It seems to come back to the individual after all, doesn't it? Well, so then you came to uh, Nebraska, or I mean, um, your biography says that you received a Bachelor of Science degree in from Lincoln. Was that after you had your first year or two years? Oh, yes. Year? Uh, see, I had uh, three years of college credit, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, plus the two first years of, me of uh, medicine, and that added up to an actual bachelor's degree. And I mean the genuine bachelor's degree, not the bachelor of science in medicine that they were no. giving. Bachelor, regular bachelor of science. This was mm -hmm. granted by the Arts College, not the College of Medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in any case, conferred eligibility for registration in the graduate college, which was the major part of it, the point. Then did you register in the graduate college? I registered in the graduate you? college at the end of my sophomore year. See, I had a year out uh, between my sophomore and junior years as a fellow in the Department of Anatomy. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that reflected in your bar? I don't know whether that? that's uh, reflected in there or not. Well, I think we ought to get that in. You received your because, master's. Because uh, you notice the master's degree is there. Yes, that was in '32. Yes, I was. Um, well, I yes, was in the department in, uh, yes. 30, 30, uh, 31, mm -hmm. and then while I'm, uh, during the course of my junior year, mm -hmm. I wrote my master's thesis and took the degree in January of '32. What was your thesis on? On the. Uh, Development of the spleen. Mm -hmm. And then you received your MD in 34. I got my MD in 34. Uh, with under, you see, there's another year's delay there uh, because at the end of my junior year, I got my faculty appointment and had to split my senior year. <laughs> mm. That makes it pretty complicated, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's so the right. class I started with graduated in 32. Mm -hmm. 
Then I brought back to the class of 33 through the medium of that fellowship here. And um, when did it, you decide that, that you wanted to be a teacher of anatomy? That must have had some influence. And oh, there uh, must have I, been... got, uh, I got interested in the field to the point that it just kind of appealed to me during that fellowship year. Yeah. And uh, I think I dropped a remark around occasionally that yeah, this would be a life that would suit me fairly well. Well, it just turned out uh, one time, I remember uh, early that summer, at the end of my junior year, Dr. Ladd flagged me down and told me there was an opening in the department. They tried out a fellow that had come up here from St. Louis to teach up in gross anatomy, and they, uh, they tolerated him for two years and fired him, and there was the opening. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh -huh. they caught me and jumped me into the opening in the fall of 32, and I'm still around. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that was about the way. Well, and then I suppose that uh, at this time, with uh, teaching anatomy as a, a career, one could take the uh, track towards a PhD or MD, or and you well, chose of course, to see, do I both. Well, see, I was uh, I was up to my senior year in medicine. It was silly not to complete the degree, uh -huh. and I wasn't totally sure at that point that I was going to stay in the department of anatomy forever. Uh -huh. This was at the bottom of the depression. Here was an opportunity to get a perfectly good, uh, it looked at those time reasonably well-paying job, uh, yeah. while my pals and classmates were going off into internships where they were getting $25 a month or nothing and going out into practice and being paid in ham and eggs because nobody had any money. <laughs> That's right. Uh -huh. So it looked like an uh -huh. awfully good stopgap at least uh, to take in a year or two or three and see what developed. And future security probably. Uh, uh, so it was obviously the, obviously the thing to do was to complete my MD degree. Yeah. Then when it began to look as though I was going to uh, uh, be around more or less permanently. In those days it was legal to carry a full instructorship and regular faculty membership of that kind and be registered in the graduate college uh -huh. at the same time. Uh -huh. So on that basis, but I went ahead and took my PhD in anatomy. Great. Apparently Dr. Latta had some uh, influence in your uh uh, well, decisions? Uh, the two major contributors to my yes. decision, of course, were Ladder and Pointer. Ladder and Pointer, yeah. Well, we know Dr. Ladder pretty well, and uh, we've interviewed Dr. Ladder, but we're trying to find out as much as we can about Pointer and his relationships with his students and faculty and administration. Because he doesn't say well, very much about himself in his papers. Well, Pointer was uh, quite an amazing personality, and probably a good deal more so, and a good deal more influential on all the students that went by during his years as professor of anatomy. Mm -hmm. That's where these old timers remember him and think of him all the time. Yes. Uh, from uh, uh, when I was in the last class that had him as full time professor of anatomy. Mm -hmm. See, uh, Keegan. Uh, uh, Keegan resigned in the, sum, in the uh, summer of 1929 and uh, they promptly put Pointer in as interim dean for, I think he occupied that position as interim dean for about a year and then was made permanent dean where he stayed until the end of World War II, until 1946. He was in that office 17 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, from that time on, of course, the students saw him in an entirely different light. It was now well, well, king of the campus which he ran with an iron hand, and uh, this was an absolutely autocratic situation. I mean, um, uh, Dr. Pointer spoke, and thus it was. Oh, he conferred <laughs> with people. He yes. took a lot of advice, mm -hmm. but uh, he didn't go through a committee if any time he wanted to make a decision or anything of that kind. Uh, he'd appoint his own committees and usually follow their recommendations, but when he decided to make up his mind, why well, he made up his mind, and that was it. Uh -huh. And at least at the time I came to school, the dean was almost a single-handed admissions committee anyway. Pointer mm -hmm. sat in judgment, well, I'm going to take you in, and I don't think you can make it, and so forth and so on. And he passed it on to a committee, but primarily Pointer admitted the class, Pointer spotted the internships, Pointer decided who was going to be chairman of departments when uh, one resigned and another came and had to be replaced. Yeah. Uh, 
point are made very sure that the hospital superintendent was uh, the assistant su superintendent because he was the superintendent. Yes. And Saxon over there in the uh, service building was the assistant operating superintendent. And Pointer ran the show. Saxon uh, had uh, mostly buildings and grounds. Buildings and grounds business, and uh, uh, maintenance and operations yeah. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even so, at that point, then the dean's secretary did what we have. The dean and his secretary did what <laughs> everybody down here on the fifth floor does now. Yes, plus a lot of other people. Uh, plus a lot of other people. Uh huh. Oh, uh -huh. well, we had a cashier. Yes. There was Saxon. Saxon had a small staff, and uh, there were the helping personnel. Darcy was uh, old Richard Darcy. Now you may have heard of him. Yes. The yes. Uh, little the Englishman, gardener. the gardener. Uh huh. Pretty well ran the uh, grounds in particular, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he was lord and king of the grounds. If anybody was walking across the <laughs> lawn or in his flower bed, and that included the chancellor of the university or the dean or anybody else, he'd tell him to get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had a very beautiful garden out here. This right campus there. was a thing of beauty in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had a beautiful nice trees. quadrangle uh, with the driveways coming around. Mm -hmm. And uh, trees that were growing up, when I first came here, they were comparatively small trees. They were great big ones when they finally cut them down to put up this building. But beautiful canna beds. Mm -hmm. They were made at the, uh, and the lawn in those days was manicured. So this was really kind of a show place. Mm -hmm. At that time, we had the units one and two of the hospital. Oh, uh, unit two was completed, I think, in twenty-seven. About twenty-seven, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right within a year. Mm -hmm. So that it, uh, it was there and operational when I came to school. The uh, Conkling Hall, of course, had gone up a few years before. Yes. And the amphitheater had been added to the north building. The north amphitheater was there. And I had no reason at that point for thinking it hadn't been there forever. <laughs> uh huh. It was the. Um, and uh, are you interested in well, what the campus was like, what the buildings were at that point, as nearly as I can remember? Yes, the north and south buildings. There were the, of course, there were the north and south buildings, and uh, hospital units one and two, and Conklin okay. Hall, which was the nursing nurses' home. But in addition to that, uh, uh, there was an addition put on Conkling Hall, about 30 or 31. Yes. Before then, there was a little kind of a, looked almost like a barracks, a bunkhouse looking affair, down the hill, oh, down by the power plant. Oh, is that where it is? Oh, uh, I think that had been in two places, but as I remember, it was down the hill, down by the power plant. Yes. The power plant was there, but no the service power plant. Bath. The uh, beginning of the power plant was there. Uh -huh. They've added to it a great deal since. Uh -huh. The smokestack was there, and it had been struck by lightning twice during, um, oh, right around those years. Mm -hmm. Scared the nurses to get death in that building right next door when the bricks came pattering down on the yeah. ceiling. But the old nurses, yes, that had burned uh, years before that. But the barracks, you thought, had been moved from place to place on the campus. Was it in I World remember, War II? Seems to me, I remember. Uh, uh, of course, this is uh, World War, World War, War I. I. World War One surplus uh, barracks. I really don't know. It certainly was not a Quonset hut. No, I've seen pictures of it. I think you've seen pictures of it. it. Uh huh. And it looks like a. But uh, within two years of the time I came here, they put the addition on Conkling Hall and tore that down. Oh, I see. That's the west end of Conkling Hall. Yes, I know. You can see where it was. And they eliminated a very good tennis way. court that had occupied that place before. Oh, I thought the tennis court was west of the hospital. They were. They were put oh. there soon when they uh, put the addition on Conklin oh, Hall. Oh, I see. Uh huh. Yeah, because I've. Then seen they tore up the baseball diamond and the uh, cinder track, and quit having interfraternity hard ba hard ball baseball games out there oh. in favor of the tennis courts, and also eliminated the uh, medic relays, which they held all through the 1920s and in which all the high schools in Omaha competed. Oh, they did. Hmm. The re in the relays, I didn't know medic the high school. Relays. Because we have some cups in there that that were given for relays and cross country. Mm -hmm. There was both interfraternity uh, oh. competition and the medic mm -hmm. relays, mm -hmm. uh, high school competition. 
it sounds to me like the inter -fratern or the fraternities were pretty strong then. Well, that time there were five of them, and uh, between the five of them, uh, the membership of each fraternity and the group that belonged to none were about equal. That really, the non-fraternity uh -huh. group just about constituted a sixth, uh, a sixth group. Yes. Were they organized, the non-Greeks? No, no, they weren't. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did they all have houses? They all had houses. And of course, a fair proportion of the student body was living in one or another or another of those fraternity houses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. Now there's only one. No, there's, well, I don't know whether one the fire rolls, um still exist without a house or whether they've actually gone, well, whether they've actually uh, uh -huh. gone the way of all the other fraternities, leaving Phi Chi alone. Phi Chi uh -huh. is the only one that has a house anymore. Yeah. Did you belong to a fraternity? Or yes. Really? When I was in medical school, I belonged to Phi Beta Pi, which was one of the early ones to disappear. Mm -hmm. Had a house down on 38th Street. They had a house down on 38th Street. Uh, north of Farnham. Uh, north of Farnham, yeah. about two doors down from Dodge Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the number was 116 South. I think that was the number. Don't write that down because that might be wrong. <laughs> Well, we can there's always a, verify. Uh, 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 there's a brick apartment house now where that oh, house right. was. They tore oh, the house down. One of those slip-in apartments. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Then the AKs had a house over in there, and I don't remember exactly where it was. Alpha Kappa Kappa. Yes. Well, that's I think they remember because they have left a, uh, a small scholarship fund, which is still active. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The New Sigma Nu, which left another scholarship fund, um, and was really a very strong fraternity at one time, had a place down on 33rd Street. Yes. Uh -huh. The Phi Chi's at that point were on the corner of 36th and Dewey, in yeah. the house that the old Gifford House. Gifford House. Mm -hmm. And the Phi Rolls had the palace right here across the street, <laughs> which degenerated and finally went down here about a year ago. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, the AKKs uh, were up on. 38th and Jones at one time, too, Oh, they? yes. They moved two or three times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had a place up on Farnham Street, too, not far oh. from 38th and Farnham, in one of those old uh, houses there. Uh-huh. Did they sort of dominate the um, student life, or was it... Oh. Uh, more a matter of a good place to live? They were a pretty important thing in student life. Mm -hmm. And they did establish kind of cliques in the student body. Um, the rem some of the remnants of that you can still see right up to the present time. Talk yes. about getting together at class reunion. Oh. Something of that kind. You take the class of 34. Well, you have the uh, people that are left from that class around town, center around Howard Morrison and a few more. And to this day, they think of the fire rolls right off first, and they hardly remember anybody else. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it did make the student body kind of clicky. There was this group and that group and another group. And there used to be a good deal of byplay, competition for scholarship, and some undercover deals. Well, every once in a while, somebody tried to pull off a deal and get, the question, and get examination questions. <laughs> For this particular fraternity, no way yes. they were going to. Uh, yes. Those were going to become available to anybody else. Well, even as late as 1948, when I came here, it was said that um, the Phi Rose had a, a file of the uh, basic science and the state board exams. Well, all the fraternities had files of all the examinations that they could get their hands on. Uh huh. Uh -huh. All of them had that. Which, as far as I can see, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, the examinations yeah. were mimeographed, and the students took the exams home, and sure. they built a file out of them. Mm -hmm. I don't see that there was anything wrong with that. Uh -huh. But Did that had to do with questions that had been asked. When yes. it came to kind of getting hold of questions that were going to be asked, then the water gets a little muddy. Then, then <laughs> it's a little sticky. But there, there wasn't any other student organization, was there, like a student council or... Student AMA or any of those? Oh, uh, the student AMA didn't exist. I didn't. There was supposedly a student council, uh -huh. which, as far as I can see, uh, got together. It was made up of two members each. 
from the school of nursing, the non-fraternity group in each of the fraternities. Uh -huh. and they'd get together about once a year and stand on the steps of the hospital and have the picture taken, and that was about <laughs> all they ever did. <laughs> I want to be sure that was working. You'll find a little of that uh, in those two issues of the Caduceus. Yes, that's his... The student a, council group yes. will be there. The uh -huh. staff, of course, for the yearbook, as long as they had a yearbook, which yes. was just those two just years, will be years. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and some of those scholarships and so forth were... Um, are, they're listed in the um, school catalog, which we have, of course. They, uh, some of those, of course, hung, uh, carried right over into uh, my time, to my time on the, uh, on the scholarship, scholarship and award committee, committee uh -huh, previously uh -huh. Student Assistance Committee. Yeah. The uh, Conkling Scholarship, Jetter Rig, uh, what was Jetter Riggs and Jenny Hanscom Conkling yeah. Scholarship was one of the major prizes for years and years. The Omaha Medical Foundation, and you know the story about that, about how that came into being. That that's very recent, though. The no, the Omaha Medical, Medical Foundation goes clear that? back. That came out oh. of uh, oh, oh, that came out of I uh, don't know that. Uh, money that was put to, uh, raised by a group of physicians here in Omaha uh, to buy land that was for some reason or other was never used, and they decided oh. to pool it together and establish the Omaha Medical Foundation instead. Now I'm a little I'm a little foggy on the details there, but Key, you wrote that up. That's in that history of the school and the Caduceus. Exactly oh. how it started. Well, I'll have to check back on that because um, I wasn't aware. You see, of that, that little sketch that Key wrote there is a old mine for mm -hmm. uh, information up to 1929. Yeah. Then the article that he wrote in um, uh, oh, later about 1965 yeah. that he presented at the. Um, um, Point of Foundation mm -hmm. dinner, that that wasn't as. I think in some ways that was less complete. I think that was yes. abstracted from the. Yes, and well, uh, some of the uh, period that he covered, he didn't have firsthand actual participation in those events. That like after nineteen thirty. No, from nineteen thirty on, of course, uh, he was uh, chairman of the Department of Surgery. And I'm sure he was made chairman of the Department of Surgery when B.B. Davis died, which was in the, I've got a handle on that, that was in the spring of 1933. Oh. That was Herbert H. Davis's father. Yes, though. yes. So he was very active around here and a highly important figure in the Department of Surgery for years and years. Mm -hmm. But the actual full-time administration of the school, of course, but when he resigned as dean, he, he dropped out of that because he became primarily a practicing neurosurgeon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit disjointed because of spot checking around <laughs> here and there. Is that all well, right? Well, that's is all right. That's all right because when we get through uh, transcribing mm -hmm. it, then um, uh, we sort of abstract mm -hmm. it to show where, uh, what uh, points we covered mm -hmm. and we can index mm -hmm. it according Keegan to... Keegan had been here, of course, all the way through um, the development of the school here in Omaha, right from the beginning, because he was in school the time they moved up. Oh. Graduated, I think, in the second class that graduated here. Mm -hmm. I think he, gra he graduated in 1915. Mm -hmm. Then he went right up like a rocket. You see, he began teaching pathology. He was teaching in anatomy. Uh, and he was already primary, uh, uh, prime importance in the Department of Pathology before he went off to World War One. Yes. And um, he came back, and uh, I forget just what positions he occupied there, but when Cutter left, he seemed to be the uh, crown prince. And, uh, no, Pointer was the real crown prince, but Cutter put him in to keep Pointer out, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which worked for four years, and then Keegan resigned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is about the time that, um, that your second unit at the hospital was opened, and... Um, I understand that uh, when it was completed, they didn't have enough money. There wasn't enough money appropriated to uh, to operate it, to buy equipment and operate. My memory it. on that is that they opened it up, and by the time um, well, I got to my clinical years, uh, they were oper they were operating the thing almost to capacity. 
uh, they had intern quarters were out in the front, you know, where the, over the uh, mm -hmm. uh, right in behind the pillars. And of course, the library had moved in and was occupying a wing, mm -hmm. as you well know and remember. Yes. And the uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but they had a pediatric ward over there. They had an active psychiatric ward over there. Mm -hmm. And, and radiology was over there. Radiology was over there, down on the ground floor, mm -hmm. so-called basement floor. Yes. Then they took the top floor. They did all kinds of things out of it. They converted that into a student lab at one time, where the junior students went yes. and did their work. Yes. And that was as it was um, when I was a junior. Well, it was but also the depression hit, and the legislature promptly cut the uh, budget of the whole university. Yes. And Pointer promptly said, well, "All right, we can't operate on that basis. We'll just shut down some wards." So at that point. A lot of the stuff over there in Unit 2 was shut down. Mm -hmm. And really and truly um, was idle for three or four years before they began to open it up again. They shut down the psychiatric ward and never did reopen that. Well, there was a little... Was that about the time that Bennett left? Bennett left a few years... No, no, uh, that wasn't connection uh, with Bennett leaving. Uh, the problem with Bennett was the psychiatric ward, which was down at the old Clarkson Hospital, which was almost his personal baby. Uh -huh. And the Clarkson got into a hassle over that uh, with Bennett. That was part of the story. And the university service, I think, signed, uh, uh, sided in with the uh, Clarkson Hospital. And that ceased to be uh, Bennett's own particular personal realm. And uh, at that point, Bennett couldn't operate on the scale to which he was accustomed to. He pulled out and went to California. Uh -huh. But that was about uh, that was about 1929 or 30. I'm not 1939 no. or 40. Yes, that was later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think the psychiatric ward over here was shut down in 1932. And it just never did open again. It never did open up again. I can remember when I first came here that windows had bars on them up there. Well, that was what the old ward L. They still had mm -hmm. the bars on the windows. Mm -hmm. Um, you've served on many committees on the faculty. It looks to me like you've been on student assistant for a long time, on the uh, scholarship and awards committee, uh, curriculum committee, examinations committee. Anything else that I missed? Those are the main ones. Somehow or other I managed to avoid the admission, admissions committee. <laughs> for which quietly on the side I can say, glory be, I'm glad I never... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Had to face that one. The examinations committee was a rather rough, uh, rather rough business. It also doubled as a thesis committee. For that was oh. back in the time when the senior thesis was required. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Well, they had a separate thesis committee, though. Senior thesis. Well, this, at, uh, at this time, when I was on it, the examinations committee was also the thesis committee. Uh huh. And um, it also prepared and administered this comprehensive examination they gave at the end of the oh, senior year. Oh, yes, they had that. I remember that. Well, and this was, the, when you were on the examinations committee, this was uh, during the war years, 43, 44. That's right. 44, 45. Um, and didn't we have um, an accelerated program then? At that point, we had the accelerated program. Yes. How did that work out? It worked out all right. Everybody was kind of weary of it at the end, because it was a case of going right around the right around the calendar, mm -hmm. right on the heels, of course, uh, of uh, being used to uh, knocking off about the middle of June and coming back late <laughs> in September. Yeah. And then the uh, June after the uh, June after Pearl Harbor, yes. after a bit of hassling and uh, uh, getting the thing straightened around, we just picked up the next class that applied for entrance in medical school and started them in June instead of September. Ran the nine months, which meant they finished the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, that academic year in March and started right off on the next one. Took a class in in March. Yes. And of course that wound up in December. Yeah. And it just very uh, appropriately turned out that we were back on schedule again at the end of the war and uh, we went from there. But that way we got, ran four classes through in three years by picking up those mm -hmm. summers. Mm -hmm. 
It's a little confusing when you want to go back and look at the commencement programs. Oh, uh, so because forth, there were two classes that graduated yes. in '43. That's where the double up came. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But by and large, these students did uh, as well scholastically as uh, uh, the old program. Oh, except right. for a few of the classes that that were admitted to the program, particularly the last one, uh -huh. that, uh, where a good many of the students were kind of almost assigned to the program out of the service. Oh. Mm -hmm. In my land, we had uh, uh, we had a class there toward the end of the war where I think a number of them figured they were just assigned to medical school and they didn't particularly care. And um, about two days after the war was over, 15 or 16 students just walked out of that freshman class. Oh, really? All of whom were failing at the time. People staff because mm -hmm. um, about half of the uh, key clinical staff was off in the service. Yes. So the rest that were staying home, and some of them were the ones that were physically unfit, and some of them were the ones that one way or another didn't get in, and some of them were the old timers that were a bit over age, and they all did double duty and managed to run the hospital service and do the teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did that kind of an accelerated program compare with the one we had more recently when you put students through in three years? It was quite a different business. Uh, the accelerated program putting students through in three years required oh, a bit of alteration in the uh, curriculum. I don't remember the details of that terribly well, but uh, it was a matter then of uh, taking certain students and pushing them along faster as they were capable of going instead of oh. taking the entire class and mm -hmm. making up time by dropping out the summer vacations. Mm -hmm. Of course, at the end of that, we never did get our real summer vacation back again at the end of the accelerated program. Oh. Because then they began putting in different activities, uh, additional time in the senior year and that kind of thing that began to fill in the summers. Like starting the classes in July. And uh, uh, then they, uh, later they began starting classes in July. And of course, uh, far more recently than that, we got into this general overall uh, three-year program. Uh, which we are just working our way out of right now. And that's all very, very recent history and perhaps replete with some rather sore points here and there. I'm not, uh, <laughs> well, it's part of the history of the It's part of the history problem. of the school. It's extremely recent history. Yeah. Yes. And, of course, there are a lot of people around that had their fingers in that pie would deal more deeply than I did mm -hmm. because except for the time of year we taught, it did not affect their teaching and anatomy very much. Except to cut down hours, didn't it? Except to cut down hours. Well, that was a general trend in medical education all over the country, to cut down hours in anatomy. And the other basic sciences, too? The other basic sciences got cut back some, but anatomy had the biggest slice of pie, so that's where, of course, they cut the most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, when I was a freshman, when I started medical school, uh, the entire first year was anatomy, except for a course in bacteriology that was given during the first eight weeks. Hmm. No, that, no biochemistry, the, no... No, bio biochemistry and physiology started in the sophomore year. Mm -hmm. So did immunology and so did pathology. And introductory clinical courses. Mm -hmm. But the bacteriology was given in the freshman year and other than that it was all anatomy. Well, no wonder if they flunked anatomy they flunked. No wonder cool. at all. <laughs> the first eight weeks of school, what the freshman walked into was Dr. Lavis' course in embryology and the course in bacteriology. Yeah. And it was bacteriology then, it wasn't microbiology. Nobody coined no. that term yet. Uh -huh. And it was a department of bacteriology and pathology, it was, wasn't uh, it? That's right. Mm -hmm. We had a fellow here by the name of Myers that taught the bacteriology. Eggers was the head of the department. Yes. Of pathology and bacteriology. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Well, then you got to the end of the first eight weeks. Then you went into histology, and gross anatomy started and ran clear to the end of the year. Yes. Uh-huh. And that was the dominant thing in the freshman year from that point on. Well, what do you consider some of the highlights of uh, uh, 
happenings on this campus, either in your student years or uh, in your teaching years, in your chairmanship years. Can you re recall some of the, let's say, controversies, uh, uh, such as uh, full-time clinical faculty and... Uh, well, very well indeed. Uh, the, uh, to take that one up specifically, <laughs> uh, the full-time cl um, full clinical faculty just was not to be thought of, really, until World, until, uh, World War II. We were, this place was operated by this by the volunteer faculty. Uh, there had been uh, a uh, a paid man who wasn't entirely full time as a head of radiology. That was Carlton Pierce uh, the first year I was here. Then Hunt came and was from clear on up till he finally retired. Mm -hmm. We had a a, a man uh, who was again paid part time and was around quite a bit of the time in. Uh, up in the operating room is an esthetist, oh. mm -hmm. Dr. McAvan. And he doubled down at another hospital. And uh, they were uh, paying. Uh, they were paying some of the pathologists uh, uh, part time. Dr. Joel Weinberg yeah. was in the department of pathology and. Uh, doing a good deal of the autopsy service and teaching the course in clinical pathology. Mostly while Eggers ran off and did the pathology out in Emanuel Hospital instead. <laughs> uh -huh. But other than that, uh, it was strictly volunteer staff except for the uh, basic science departments. Mm -hmm. And by uh, uh, current standards, they were all very, very small. Basic science yes. faculty. Yes. Let's just see, in anatomy, uh, when I joined the staff, that meant they had, as a full-time man, that meant they had, uh, well, three full-time right. people in the department. There was Willard mm -hmm. and Lana and myself, mm -hmm. and Pointer over in the dean's office, who got over once in a while, and Grudinsky, who was yes. paid part-time to uh, really run the course of gross anatomy after Pointer became dean. Oh. And then, except for fellows and Odds yes. and ends of volunteer yeah. assistance and so on. That was it. Because Godinsky had a private practice, didn't he? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me I remember some discussion when I first came here about um, somebody in child and maternal health uh, yes. being paid by federal funds. Yes, those were the first two full time people that came in. I was going to get to that. Oh. And the uh -huh. two in question were Willis Brown and John Getgood. And they remain, and uh, those positions remain the only full, uh, the only full time positions that we had, up uh, practically to the end of World War One. And by that time, World War Two, mm -hmm. and by that time, I think Get Good had dropped off a little and had a little office up up Forty uh, Second Street, mm -hmm. and Brown uh, resigned and went over to the University of Iowa. Let me see. I don't think we had any more. I don't think we brought in very many more full-time people. They finally brought in a full-time chairman of uh, for obstetrics and gut for OB and GYN, namely Odell. And you remember Odell. that that was a catastrophe. Yes. yes. Then they began putting them in, and we finally got our full-time chairman when the group uh, of Gibbs and Grissom and Musselman and uh, O and OB. Uh, Holly. Holly, mm -hmm. when they came. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we started there... adding and building up from there. Yes. There was a great deal of opposition, though, from the oh, yes. practicing physicians. Yes, wasn't? there was. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I think Dr. Herbert H. Davis had been paid part-time as chairman of the Department of Surgery before Musselman came. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moody had been chairman of in uh, internal medicine, but he uh, wasn't on the paid faculty. No, I, don't think, I, mean, I don't think Moody was ever paid. Mm -hmm. And of course, by the time when Bliss was chairman, why well, it was purely volunteer business. Right. Mm -hmm. This all happened um, when uh, Dr. Luth was dean. Was it his? Well, an awful lot more of it happened even after Luth's time. Well, 
really and truly yeah. during Wolf's administration as dean, nothing changed very much. Nothing happened, huh? Except that there began to be warfare between the faculty and the dean's office. <laughs> and um, because and uh, because of that, uh, Gus down in Chancellor Gustafson <clears throat> kind of felt that the University down in Lincoln had to take over the management of the College of Medicine more and more and move a good deal of the administrative uh, work to Lincoln, which meant the dean had to keep going through Lincoln all the time. I see. And of course, that's the situation as it was when Tolman came in and Land Tolman had his hands tied for a good deal of time he was dean. It took Whitson to break that up by telling him neither he or anybody else would take the job unless they could run the show. But prior to that, prior to the time uh, when when Cutter and Pointer were and Keegan were dean, they pretty ma much managed their own affairs. They right? pretty much ran the show. Uh huh. And then the drift, the uh, pulling of the power down to Lincoln came during the time that uh, that Luth was dean. No, there was no way Lincoln was going to step in and run anything up here when any of those three people were here. You think this was done by Gustafson because he felt this was the way it should be, or because well, he the was situation sort of under uh, was kind of uh, it was kind of a matter of rescuing at that point because mm -hmm. things weren't going well around here. Mm -hmm. Then Gustafson himself resigned, and Harden came in uh, right at about that time. And the situation was operating out of Lincoln, and uh, Harden kind of froze it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I think it made it a little easier for Ben Greenberg to keep his thumb in the pie. And that was during <laughs> the period, you know, when he was reg uh, regent for years region. and years and years. And he felt that he was kind of helping to run and the And kind of felt the medical school was his baby. Mm -hmm. I want to see what are other things that uh, well, might give some, uh, of some interest. The um, when the big push came. Well, there are to so many, many things that I can well, remember when, over that whole period of years. They have to do all the way from uh, people that came and went to changes in the campus to changes in the building to the. Uh, PWA works program yeah. under which quite a bit of work was done through the early 1930s. About all of the uh, construction that took place in the 30s uh, was PWA, wasn't it? Yes. The it was addition, PW, uh, addition to the South uh, Laboratory building? That came uh, was just that? at the end of the 30s. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I date that around 1940. Mm -hmm. Well, as I understand it, they finished up the last bucket of tar on the roof just as the program was cut off at the beginning of World mm -hmm. War II. Mm -hmm. But the expansion of um, the service building and the enlarging of the heating plant and all that. A lot of that was done with PWA mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, when they expanded the service building, then they took the services down there and tore up that old white building that used to sit back of uh, uh, the north building, now Pointer Hall, and yeah. served at one time or another as the carpenter shop carpenter and later shop. the laundry. Oh, was that the laundry? At a time too? for a time that was the laundry. In its early days it was not only the carpenter shop, but also served there was a place behind there where they kept the sheep. The sheep? They had a <laughs> sheep there uh, yes. that they maintained in order to get blood for sheep cells for the old washerman test. Uh, and some medical student always uh, got the job for a little bit of pin money of going out a couple of times a week and wrestling that sheep down and bleeding it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when the big push came to uh, enlarge the hospital or um, take advantage of some of the federal construction money, uh, wasn't there another big uh, hassle about and controversy about which way do we go? Do we build a big hospital and well, do we a, go uh, east? Oh, uh, there was a, a big controversy over how many beds we were going to add uh, when we went ahead and put up uh, Unit 3. Mm -hmm. And that finally got resolved by trimming down the size of the unit a bit, but also uh, it involved pulling the clinics. 
the outpatient department, we used to call it the dispensary, out of the bottom two floors of the south building and putting them under the same roof of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So all right, uh, that came along um, during the early part of uh, Tolman's uh, career as dean. Mm -hmm. And then Holly, of course, and a few more launched this grandiose scheme of walking out of that and starting all over again and putting a big hospital across 42nd Street, leaving the clinics over there. Well, that was the thing that produced the, uh, the big hassle in all those meetings and the white paper and all that kind of thing. Yes. And it wound up by torpedoing that whole project. We lost some money that way. The, uh, we had that quarter of a mil levy, and then apparently we lost that because of the controversy of it. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Is it part of that? What? They rather, log they rather logically said, until you can get your minds made up, forget the money. Yeah, we'll give it to dentistry. Yeah. I understand dentistry built their building with what might have been. No, I'm not sure about that point, but I think that's right, because the timing is about right. Well, this is what George Brown mm. told me. A dentistry had been housed in that old wreck of a building yeah. that also housed pharmacy, mm -hmm. which had once upon a time before all that been the chem lab down in Lincoln. That was way before my time. Has there ever been any um, uh, really um, shall we say positive talk about moving dentistry to this campus? It pops up all the time mm -hmm. and of course there's been a big move in that direction. It's just been made. Yes. Uh, not a move of physical plant, but all of a sudden they've transferred the uh, really the administration of the College of Dentistry to the medical center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think perhaps the political implications of uh, actually moving the College of Dentistry to Omaha have uh, maybe um, nobody, not many people have memories long enough to remember all the bloodletting that went on when the College of Medicine was moved up here. Yes, and the the difficulty in moving college to pharmacy up here because they tried that yeah. once before in the 50s. Uh, there was talk about moving yeah. it up here and it never came about. They built the Lyman Hall down yeah, I, in Lincoln but eventually it came. Somehow or other the people down in Lincoln and the businessmen down in Lincoln and all that didn't seem to worry as much about the College of Pharmacy pulling out as they did the College of Medicine. Mm -hmm. That was a real hassle. And it went through the legislature, uh, oh, two or three times, and it finally passed by a very, very small margin. And there were a whole group of men uh, here on this campus. Stokes was one of them, I remember. A.C. Stokes were highly active in getting that done. Mm -hmm. But then a bunch of teachers, of course, down there in Lincoln, like old Herbert Waite, and uh, Old Albert Mitchell, who was not on the faculty anymore, but was still practicing in Omaha, in Lincoln at in that Lincoln. time. Yeah. They were turned up at the pre-med activities all the time, and there were a whole lot of things that looked awful kind of strange about the whole business there. Uh -huh. It suddenly become perfectly natural when you realize they were on the other side of that whole move, and uh, were sort of left behind when the medical college pulled out, and also Orr. I was going to say, didn't Orr the, had uh, something? Oh, Orr had a great deal. Yes. It left, of course, a lot of feeling between Orr and Pointer because they had been partners when Pointer started practice before he moved off into anatomy. Mm -hmm. And the uh, ferocious warfare that went on forever, primarily between Orr and Lord, but as oh, long yes. as they lived between Orr and anything that looked like orthopedics in Omaha. Yes. And the orthopedic hospital in Lincoln, which yes. remained remained in Lincoln and Orr's baby right up to the end right of Orr's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any help from Creighton either. In, uh, no, we didn't. Uh, established no, it. as a matter of fact, uh, that was one of the major arg uh, arguments against a movement of the medical school here, mm -hmm. was the fact there was already one here. And the Creighton staff weren't enthusiastic about uh, the entire university college coming up here, except that they already had the Omaha Medical College, and they already had the clinical years yes. of, the, of the University of Nebraska here in Omaha uh -huh. uh, from 1902 to, 
well, 1913 in actual fact, 1910 till the decision was made. 10 yeah. or 11. Yeah. That's about right, isn't it? Well, uh, the till 1913 is when the first class. 13 yeah, was yeah, well, yeah. the building. But I mean, the, mm -hmm. the the decision was made mm -hmm. in 1910 because that's, that's the way I remember it. Yes. That's when the legislature finally gave them the money to establish the The building was the North campus. Building, Point, yes. presently Pointer Hall, was actually opened and was the College of Medicine in the fall of 1913. Yes. Mm -hmm. Having been through the tornado that spring. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it seems as though the controversy uh, is uh, hardly settled now as to medical school here or there. But, um, Once in a while you hear a whisper that the medical school wants to go back to Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no way you can imagine it with the plant we have here now at the medical center. No. But a great many of the reasons for taking your medical school out of the lap of the university and putting it in the neighboring, much larger city, those reasons largely cease to exist anymore. Yes, uh, the big argument was the uh, availability of clinical uh, material to exactly. the indigent patient. And uh, working on the supposition that the university hospital was an indigent hospital yes. and that the clinics were a place for indigents. Yes. That's how the whole thing ran. Yes. As chairman of the department, you've been on the executive faculty. Uh, were you on the executive faculty as an electric mem elected member before you became chairman of the department? No, there weren't. I don't think there were any elected members at that point. I can't remember when they had. No, I first went on the executive faculty as mm -hmm. chairman of the Department of Anatomy. Mm -hmm. Well, they had some odds and ends of additional positions on the executive faculty. Well, they uh, had before representatives, that point, and representatives and, um, and so on. And so forth. I ought to remember that a little bit more precisely because it was along about that time that uh, the group of four of us rewrote the rules and regulations for the faculty that were not too different from the ones they're about to uh, scuttle right now. The group of four? There were four of us. What do they call that? A committee of what? From the, what kind of a I don't remember. It was an odd hope committee to uh, revise and rewrite the rules and regulations for the faculty of the College of Medicine. And that committee consisted of myself, and McGugan, and Musselman, and Grissom. Mm -hmm. What occasion the the um, what brought about that? Uh, the full time people or? Um, of course, by that time, the full-time staff was growing. Yes, and this controversy... But also, at the same time, the controversy between the full-time staff and the volunteer staff was in full swing. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you had to be very, very careful on how you uh, put the thing together to be sure the volunteer staff had all the representation they should have and that there were volunteer staff members on the executive faculty, all was in addition to the chairman of, the of the, uh, each clinical department. Mm -hmm. And there were even, I think at that point, one or two clinical departments still left around here that were still, uh, that were still volunteer. Yes, well... And ophthalmology was the last one to go. Like, like ophthalmology and orthopedic surgery and urology... The orthopedic surgery and, and urology. Uh, otolaryngology. They were, some of those were considered part of the surgery department, weren't they? They were independent but, departments. Uh -huh. They talked about them as the minor specialties, and usually yes. the chairman in each case got his um, <laughs> began to show his teeth when you did. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. see, uh, well, we didn't have a uh, full-time chairman for uh, otorhinolaryngology until uh, Yarrington. Yarrington came in. That's very recent. And uh, and uh, Hood was still chairman of orthopedics until they brought in uh, Conley. Uh huh. And and that's, uh, that's as recent as 1973. And, uh, yes, uh -huh. and uh, Gifford was still head of ophthalmology until records came. Uh -huh. And uh, Lee yes. 
was head of, uh, I don't think there was any between Lee and the time they brought in uh, Francis Bar uh, Bartone. Uh-huh. Now, are there any more? Well, how about anesthesiology? Anesthesiology didn't exist as a, as a separate department. Oh, until Jones came. Until Jones came. Mm -hmm. Then you go back to, uh, in the first place, neurology and psychiatry were one department. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Neuropsychiatry, that was a department. Now, let me see, where did that change overcome? I think the first separate chairman for the Department of Neurology uh, was uh, Friedlander. Yes, and that was after uh, Whitson became... Uh, that was after Whitson became the dean. Dean. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, that department, uh, the last uh, volunteer off-campus chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, I guess was Richard Young. I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. Then there was a lot of uh, a hullabaloo whether we should pull, uh, put Whitson in as chairman or go to Bob Winkton or somebody like that who was in town. Yes. I understand the uh, decision was made there. Yeah. Uh-huh. When did we start to have a great deal of um, discussion about um, uh, clinical faculty salaries and fees? I don't remember exactly where that began over the hill. But back about the time, though, again, that we wrote that uh, we got to rewriting the bylaws mm -hmm. with nothing specified in the bylaws or rules and regulations. This compromise came up, but one sixth time. Mm -hmm. And what really has ever happened to that officially, I don't. I still don't know. <laughs> it's just kind of disappeared, mm -hmm. kind of vanished into the current controversy over professional fees and what should be done with them and all that kind of thing, which is still bugging the place. Yeah, and yeah. Causing feelings. Doesn't seem like it has settled much. Um, where do we stand now with the Pointer Foundation? Uh, the Pointer Foundation um, is down to the point now where, in the first place, um, it supplies uh, books within the limits of its fund, primarily on anatomical subjects for the library, and within the last couple of years has begun awarding a uh, prize, a hundred dollar prize plus a plaque, to the mm -hmm. leading student in anatomy in each freshman class. Oh, that's nice. And that's just about what the Pointer Foundation does now. We still, uh, we still exist as a foundation. Mm -hmm. When we finally dropped off the Pointer Foundation Fellowship, it looked as though we were going to completely deplete the resources. Uh, we got over into that kind of activity. Then about three or four or five years ago, uh, we had a meeting of the Board of Trustees and uh, at that point we'd about made up our mind to liquidate, to close the, close the foundation. Hmm. And then it occurred to somebody, it was pointed out to us, that our tax-exempt status as a foundation was too valuable an asset to let go. And that's the reason why the things continue to operate, but mm -hmm. it's operating very, very much at just the income from its present assets and an occasional contribution. Mm -hmm. There's no prospect at all that anybody will ever make a big contribution to the Pointer Foundation and throw it back into the business of sponsoring fellowships and that kind of thing Well, anymore. fellowships are so expensive now. In the first place, there's, um, you have to have, oh, do a little mental arithmetic here, but you're talking $10,000 or more for a fellowship. Yes. And to generate $10,000, you're talking about a hundred, uh, well over $100,000 to uh, produce the income. And land, the Pointer Foundation never did have hundred thousand dollars. I think. I think the maximum that uh, the foundation ever had was something like forty. Mm -hmm. Don't even have the speakers anymore. No, that I've stopped seen. years ago. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, we laid a few eggs on that. There were some absolutely fantastic busts that took place there. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the stories of the later, uh, the later Pointer Foundation dinners and so on were. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, 
this has been very interesting and um, we touched on a lot of subjects with uh, not too much continuity. I don't we've but, exhaustively covered anything in particular. But um, uh, we appreciate your spending the time. We're going to uh, transcribe this and um, we'll send it back to you for uh, corrections. All right. Uh, not for uh, extensive editing because we want it to go just as mm -hmm. tape will go into the archives and uh, hopefully some scholar will come along and be able to use these little tidbits to put together an interesting history of the um, uh, Well, I've got to get campus. with it here uh, and connect with well, the story of the department. I have to get that fixed up and that this year a centennial year here ought to be a very good excuse for doing it, getting it done. I have almost all of it stacked on my desk. Well, I think that would just be great if you would, because uh, there are some other people working on some other departmental histories. Uh, I hear rumors that somebody wants to do something with this, whether or not it'll, you know, gel uh -huh. into a... How a history there uh, ought to be, I don't know. You'll well, get to the point where it could be Oh, absolutely intolerably tedious to get around to all the individual financial transactions and. Uh